everyone. Um, my name is Alex Sagers, Director of Education with Louisiana Right to Life, and I have with me Dr. Evelyn Griffin, MD, who has practiced as an or practice as an OBGYN for 15 years. Um, I'm really, I'm, maybe some of you have um, seen our announcements, you know, over the past day. I, I know all week, all week long, there has been very tough conversations, very extreme conversations on one side or the other, um, dealing with so many misconceptions about um, the pro-life laws that went into effect whenever Roe v. Wade was overturned. Oh my goodness, last Friday. Uh, it has been quite a week. Um, and I just want to reach out you know, to everyone who's watching us and say, look, I know things can be confusing. Some of us are really excited and, and we're celebrating. And I know so many people out there um, are, you know, devastated in so many ways and anxious and scared because we're seeing so many polarizing conversations and people are making all kinds of claims of the kind of help that women will be able to get depending on the situations that they're in. So I want to say that we're here for you. We're here to help kind of wade through these conversations. We're here to help be a resource. We're here to help plug women into important pregnancy resources that they need. Um, there are people all throughout Louisiana, organizations all throughout Louisiana that are willing to walk with moms in their pregnancies, whatever their situation may be. So we're here, we're here to be a resource for education and a resource for services for women. Um, but today we're gonna have a very focused conversation. So here with Dr. Evelyn Griffin, um, we're gonna address certain specific misconceptions dealing with, um, so to speak, the life and the health of the mother in certain emergency situations. Um, and to also overlay this, uh, you know, there's a, one of the things that Dr. Griffin and I were kind of discussing and leading up to this is, wow, the medical and legal terminology can be very convoluted. And some people seem to be convoluting it on purpose. And some people seem to be accidentally interpreting it in a lot of different ways. And I know personally for myself, um, I look at this and think, wow, society has really failed women for well over 50 years. You know, the other side, you know, the, the extreme side of this has said that abortion is a right and that abortion is health care and has tried to define it as normal health care for years and years and years now. And so no wonder whenever we're getting down to the brass tacks of medical and legal terminology, we're very confused as to where the word abortion truly and appropriately does lie. Um, within within healthcare, um, so that's something that's fascinating. That's a narrative that has been pushed for so long that we are now in the throes of just really breaking down a society and coming to understand what that actually means. Um, and we'll be finally able to work toward a really great future where women and girls will be accepted in the workplace, where there'll be actual progress of um, of their healthcare. Right. So that that's the exciting part for me. But again, we are here for all of you who are, who may be sitting um, anxiously uh, with all the news going on. So um, as I said before, for all those people who are joining, my name is Alex Sakers. I'm the director of education for Louisiana Right to Life, and I've been working here for about seven years now. Um, and Dr. Griffin, I would like you to go ahead and introduce yourself and say a little bit about yourself and your practice. Well, thank you, Alex, for having me. I am a board certified obstetrician gynecologist, and I've been working for 15 years as an OBGYN in Louisiana. And so thank you for having me here. I'm a big believer in education and mm -hmm. um, knowing that arming yourself with knowledge is power, and it can be powerful now to have that type of education in these confusing and fearful times. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being available and being so awesome with us. Um, to start this, you know, off this discussion, you know, the especially um, other OBGYNs, you know, throughout the country have been putting out statements as well. And we look at you know, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, they put out a statement, you know, that kind of seems to feed a lot of this convolution going on um, with, of course, a lot of truth at, at the same time to what they're saying. So, I'll just read a couple of things and get your initial reaction to this. Um, they say that pregnancy imposes significant physiological changes on a person's body. These changes can exacerbate underlying or pre-existing conditions like renal or cardiac disease and severely compromise health or even cause death. 
Determining the appropriate medical intervention depends on a patient's specific condition. There are situations where pregnancy termination in the form of an abortion is the only medical intervention that can preserve a patient's health or save their life. They say, as physicians, we are focused on protecting the health and lives of the patients for whom we provide care. Without question, abortion can be medically necessary. So just your initial reaction and kind of breaking that down. Sure. So um, we, we abbreviate it as ACOG, the American College of OBGYN, and it's a professional membership organization that um, to um, they do defend quality health care for women. Um, this statement in itself, I think, is quite limited in its scope. I think they have an opportunity here to really um, empower people with education, like I said, and I think that mark was kind of missed because they are, when they say the, the term abortion, they're just throwing it out there as a general term, and that in itself can instill fear and confusion. And why, what I'm specifically talking about is the word abortion, unfortunately, is a huge umbrella term. The term actually does mean loss of a pregnancy. And, but a loss of a pregnancy, if it is a spontaneous loss of a pregnancy, in medical nomenclature or medical terminology, medical lingo in the hospital, us doctors, call a miscarriage that people will call in layman's terms, we would define it as a spontaneous abortion because it is a loss of a pregnancy, that's an abortion. Spontaneous means that it happened on its own, nothing triggered it. Mm. So spontaneous abortion is what we call a miscarriage. Whereas Roe versus Wade pertains to elective abortions. That is voluntary abortions of a healthy pregnancy out of a healthy mom. So that is specifically what we are dealing with with Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. ACOG statement that you read um, mentions the word abortion, but I think it's not fair to not qualify specifically what they're talking about. So there are certain medical treatments that will continue to be required and provided for patients who have an unhealthy pregnancy, the mom is unhealthy, et cetera, which we'll get more into. But if I think if they were to do the statement more fairly, it would be a little bit less confusing and less inciting of fear. Yeah. Um, it's to continue on that incitement of fear. I mean, people have taken what these people are saying and then have pushed it out into memes um, with also, like you say, isn't isn't fully isn't showing the full scope of what, you know, what the word, the, the terminology actually means. So, you know, an image that, that Dr. Griffin and I have passed back and forth and looked at and that she's been looking at and trying to break down. Um, it's a popular one going around right now. It says the treatment for an ectopic pregnancy is an abortion. The treatment for a septic uterus is abortion. The treatment for a miscarriage that your body won't release is abortion. If you can't get those abortions, you die. And it repeats again, you die. Um, what's been, as a doctor, you know, seeing that go around, what's your initial reaction to that? My initial reaction was fear and confusion, just like anybody else. Um, in addition, because I, I know the definitions and what's really happening better, um, shock was was the uh, number one feeling because I really didn't see this coming as the reaction and response to the overturn of Roe versus Wade, that um, the truth, meaning medical definitions, could be used and twisted around to incite fear. Um, even if you don't know what's going on, you know, a, a tweet ending with you die is going to incite fear. So right. before I get any further into this, I will appeal to everyone to kind of check their emotions and check their instincts. Any type of tweet or post, if it is trigger emotionally triggering, kind of mm -hmm. do a self check and say, what is this tweet or post trying to get me to feel or believe? And before you share it, do a little research. And um, and 
sure it's hard to find what sources are reputable, but if you read the next source and the next source and you find that, okay, this isn't emotionally triggering, it is actually very educational instead and lets me make up my mind, go with that, go with that feeling. Mm -hmm. But if it gives you a negative feeling and, you know, follow your instinct, that's, you know, something that is very powerful. So, and then ask questions. If it doesn't seem to make sense, ask questions. So to go on uh, forward with this post, um, first of all, the question of ectopic is probably, I would think, the most common one that I'm seeing being floated around. So an ectopic pregnancy is not a healthy pregnancy. So we are automatically right there not dealing with an elective abortion for an elective, healthy, viable pregnancy. So an ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that is outside the womb. It most commonly occurs in the fallopian tubes. And if it continues to grow, it in itself, it will perish because it is not in an area that can continue to survive. So the pregnancy itself at some point will pass away. Unfortunately, along the way, it can rupture, cause bleeding, internal bleeding in the mom, mother's body, and that can lead to risking her health and potentially death. So it needs to be treated. It needs, there's a medical necessity to treat that. And it is treated by either medications or surgery. And then that overall care or procedure is called treatment of an ectopic pregnancy. It is mm. not called an abortion. Wow. And in fact, I will even say that um, Planned Parenthood on their website even clarifies that. They even say specifically the treatment of, a me of an ectopic pregnancy is not an abortion. So that first sentence of that, of that meme is just outright wrong. <laughs> that was outright wrong. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'll, I'll reference specifically, oh, and treatment of, of ectopic pregnancies furthermore will continue to be available and mm -hmm. it is protected by the law. So I do have the law with me. I'll, I'll yeah. read it because I'm not a lawyer, so I don't have these bills memorized. This was um, had become an act. So Act 545 in Louisiana law, section mm -hmm. 87.1 specifically says, abortion shall not mean the removal of an ectopic pregnancy. And mm -hmm. that has its own protection under emergency care. Um, Act 548, Section 87.9, furthermore, supports that. So we have in our law, in our protection currently um, in Louisiana, that we can continue to take care of ectopic pregnancies. Right. And to reiterate what, the, what Dr. Griffin is saying, literally in our law, it says abortion shall not mean one or more of the following acts if performed by a physician. And it does go on to describe the removal of an ectopic pregnancy. Um, so yeah, what is, so next on this meme, um, I think it was the mention of uh, septic uterus, right? Am, am I correct in that? Yeah. So right. um, tell me your so, thoughts about that. Septic uterus is uh, an infected uterus. So infection in the uterus, if this infection goes into the patient or the mother's bloodstream, it can then cause overall sepsis. So infection of the whole body, and that uh, then risks all organs, risks death. And so that is something that thankfully is rare, but can occur. Now it is exceedingly rare to occur in the setting of, a, of an early pregnancy. If it were to, very often this does uh, occur at the same time as a miscarriage. But if the tissue were to be viable and it looks like the woman's health is um, at risk, first antibiotics are tried. Mm -hmm. And then if that doesn't work, then the next uh, thing is potential surgery, including a hysterectomy. So that would lead to removal of the uterus, which would lead to removal of the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. But this is something that kind of like the ectopic pregnancy, that at that point, that pregnancy would be futile and you don't want to go on to risk the mother's health. So it again falls under um, medical necessity mm -hmm. of treating this. And it would be treated not with an elective voluntary abortion, because again, that is taking out a healthy pregnancy from a healthy mom. In the scenario of a septic uterus, neither the pregnancy nor the mom is healthy. So mm -hmm. it falls under 
the guidance of the physician to treat under the jurisdiction of a medically necessary procedure that needs to be done. And mm -hmm. this is again, um, in the law, um, it's under um, the same section of um, Act 545 and 548 specifically uh, discuss this. Um, if there is any concern about the patient's um, risk to her, to her life or to her organs, we can proceed with, with taking care of her medically. And I think something to clarify for everyone watching us and for everyone talking about this, it's not like Open is in this situation and then she calls up her local abortion clinic and goes through with the proceedings of, okay, you know, them going through what normally would happen with those. I mean, women were getting abortions, over 7,000 women were getting abortions every year in Louisiana. You can guarantee that not one of those women who, and that was statistics from our local abortion clinics. You can pretty much guarantee that not one of those women were in that sort of emergency situation, you know, ectopic pregnancy or septic uterus or some of the other things that people are talking about. Now, this kind of situation if, if, if I'm writing, saying this happens in a hospital where the physicians are with her and they're having to act now or within 24 hours, really. Um, am I, am I correct in saying that? That is absolutely correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is not the type of uh, scenario that an abortion clinic takes care of. And the whole reason why abortion clinics are able to uh, provide elective abortions is because they are dealing with healthy situations, healthy women, healthy, um, they may not know if the pregnancy is healthy, but the woman has to be healthy. If she's not, then that needs to be uh, directed to a hospital. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And on that note, I, I kind of dovetail off of that is that um, abortion clinic providers or abortion providers don't have privileges at hospitals if there is a complication. Mm -hmm. so, and this is something they fought against. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this is, so this is a whole other topic that opens up that there, um, there is an unsafe situation there uh, that when, and I've dealt with many of these patients where I worked, we did not perform elective abortions, but we did deal with a lot of fallout from elective abortions, unfortunately, wow. for the, for the women and the patients. Mm -hmm. um, where they were told, well, this is a quick procedure, it's no big deal, and weren't really given much guidance as to what would happen if it didn't go all that well, and they were at home and bleeding or having a fever infection, and they would call and were told, well, go to the nearest hospital. And then so as physicians, we are then dealing with a patient that we don't have the medical records for to know what exactly happened with a woman that's bleeding or infected, scared, and then we're dealing with that too. So that is the other side of it that- so is In a sense, they created a medical emergency themselves. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and granted, the procedure of abortions is different than it was in the 1960s. Admittedly, it is safer. Sure. Most of that is thanks to antibiotics, um, I hate to say not so much because of Roe versus Wade. Antibiotics had actually helped decrease the uh, mortality or death rate from abortions much more um, yeah. before um, Roe versus Wade. So now on the flip side, we are not seeing women uh, dying at a high rate of abortions, but there's other fallout. There are serious infections of the uterus that can result after an elective abortion that we are then having to treat with IV antibiotics in the hospital. Sometimes I've taken care of these patients in the ICU because some of their organs were starting to show failure because wow. the infection was so bad. And uh, I've had to do a hysterectomy at some point because if that infection was just not able to be treated um, with antibiotics. So we mm -hmm. had to remove the, the source of infection. And so then that led to sterility and infertility for this patient. So there is a whole other side to that with respect to septic uterus that mm -hmm. can result from an elective abortion, unfortunately. That is so sad. Um, and hopefully we'll see a dramatic decrease in, in that. Um, and to, you know, even go into the next point of that, of that image that's spread around. So another clarification of the law is specifically talking about abortion and the termination of a living 
human being the, with the intention of going in and killing a living, living human being. That is what is being made illegal. So when we turn to that third line of this image, it's saying that, um, what is the exact wording of it? Um, it says the treatment for miscarriage that your body won't release is an abortion. So tell us your thoughts on that as an OBGYN. Yes. Okay. So when we have a, a there's a different types of miscarriage. Mm -hmm. um, so a miscarriage that occurs, the baby's heart stops beating, um, but we don't have any outwardly signs that a miscarriage is occurring. For example, there's no cramps or bleeding then or passage of tissue then we call that a missed abortion, meaning we have no signs of it. So that's a, that's a miscarriage. And um, we do a, a many double checks. Myself, for example, if um, I'm really only kind of confident that it is a missed miscarriage, if I've seen heartbeat in a previous ultrasound and currently we're not able to find an ultra, uh, a heartbeat, Sometimes I'll even go on to say, depending on how far along the pregnancy is, say, let's give it one more week, repeat the ultrasound, have absolute confirmation. There is still no heartbeat um, mm -hmm. and no growth of the baby. At that point, um, we can even ask another physician to come in and take a look um, to make absolutely sure um, that this is the case. Yeah. And then the woman is offered um, three options. She can wait for her body to finally recognize that, okay, miscarriage had occurred. Now I have to pass the tissue. Another option is medications that help the uterus cramp to pass that tissue. And a final one is a DNC, a dilation which surgically scoops out that tissue. Sometimes that is necessary for yeah. the situation that's brought up in this in this tweet so mm. sometimes when a miscarriage occurs part of the tissue only comes out and part of it may be stuck and mm -hmm. the uterus keeps trying to get it out and if it can't sometimes what uh leads it leads to is either infection and a little bit more often bleeding. so if there's bleeding we have a thunderstorm yeah coming. there's a thunderstorm <laughs> passing over <laughs> so if there is heavy bleeding Mm -hmm. Then we do, the, we take the patient, and whether that bleeding's from having had an abortion or having had a miscarriage, and, you know, in either cases, tissue can be left behind, mm -hmm. and that can happen in an elective abortion where not all of the tissue has come out or been removed. Yeah. So in those situations, that is, again, not a healthy pregnancy, and now it's not even viable, it's dead tissue, right. in a mom whose health is being risked. So we're back to this being not an elective situation. It's not an elective abortion. It is going for a medically necessary dilation and curatage. Right. And, and, and people were, were very concerned about the regulation of DNCs. When, and that will be con continue to be allowed. It continue right. to be provided. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because people are, because for so long, the conversation, you know, on the national level of DNC and DNA, &E, you know, all of these different procedures that do have appropriate places, absolutely, have now been mostly talked about in the media and uh, in, in terms of women's rights with an abortion, with the killing of a living human child. So that's where we need to separate it again and come down to those brass sacks again. DNCs are appropriate medical treatments, um, whether that be in a miscarriage with uh, a past or, or passing child um, or in any other removal of, of any other pathological, you know, occurrences within the uterus, right? Am, am I correct in saying that? But we're saying now you cannot use them on a living human being with the intention to specifically kill that child. That is correct with the qualification of a healthy pregnancy in a healthy. Mm -hmm. So, so the specific um, situation or exceptions here are if uh, let's say the pregnancy itself is not healthy. So mm -hmm. take a molar pregnancy, for example, right. the being mm -hmm. an unhealthy pregnancy that could also affect the woman's health mm -hmm. um, forward that is again going back to this being not an elective situation meaning mm -hmm. it's 
goes back to medical, medically necessary to treat that mm -hmm. and that it will continue to be provided. Mm -hmm. um, so specific, again, going back to law, um, if anybody needs to look at this, whether it's the public, you know, the audience or providers sometimes are confused with this. If you look at Act 545 and Act 548 in the Louisiana law, this is what spells out for us what is allowable. And in section 87.1, subsection two, it says removal of a dead unborn child, whether it be that complete miscarriage, um, missed miscarriage, inevitable miscarriage, or, you know, abortion is the other word. So incomplete abortion, inevitable abortion, spontaneous abortion, it right. will continue to be allowed for us to take care of these patients. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't think twice, it's the ethics of how to care for these patients. So if I can reference another yes. uh, part of that law, mm -hmm. specifically, I guess what, what um, you were talking about as well, Alex, is uh, delaying in emergency care. Mm -hmm. so that's another thing that has been coming up on uh, posts and social media scares is that, well, we're going to have so many women dying now because care will be delayed because in an emergency situation, the doctor is going to have to talk to a lawyer and an insurer. Not at all. We cannot deny anybody care for insurance status. That's actually against, um, it's a violation of medical practice. And then um, ethically, you can you cannot delay care if you have if a second opinion is required, then that may mean that the diagnosis is not exactly clear, the patient's not in a dire emergency where you have time to get that second opinion, or maybe the physician doesn't have a necessary set of skills. Uh, for example, just say if a um, obstetrician happens to have a, a bladder injury, for example, Mm -hmm. And uh, they typically don't deal with bladder injuries. They may, if it looks like it is safe enough to wait for another doctor, a urologist to come in, you can get them to come in. Um, but back to the diagnosis of, let's say, is a pregnancy viable, but the woman is bleeding to death. Mm -hmm. Medically and ethically, most physicians should realize that, okay, if I don't take care of this, I will lo lose both lives. Right. You know, mm -hmm. so at that point in time, you take care of what would be needed to be done. For example, a dilation and curatage to prevent that patient from bleeding to death. Mm -hmm. So, and so if anybody needs to reference this, please look at Act 545 and 548. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, um, is there any other, you know, situations that you come across? I, I know there were some that have been discussed, such as um, when a woman has this is a this is another popular one. Whenever a woman has has cancer, has been diagnosed with cancer, um, I think there's this question coming around of, okay, is abortion required for her to um, undergo chemotherapy or radiation treatment? Um, and I'm pretty sure the answer is no. It's not required. Yes. So a uh, elective abortion is never required. It can be offered and then it's patient to decide if they want one or not. So um, these types of abortions are, are done, these types of elective abortions um, for a medical necessity, let's say for women's well-being, for her poor health, for example, that is done um, in a hospital. Mm -hmm. Hospital, so abortion clinic, um, doesn't do these and shouldn't do these because it is way out of their scope. They don't deal with medical problems. They deal with very simple elective, um, elective abortions, elective, you know, voluntary um, terminations of a pregnancy in the setting of a healthy mom. Mm -hmm. If the mom is very unhealthy, then that should be taken care of in a hospital. So hospitals have, um, a regulatory requirement by CMS to have some type of ethics committee. And it's not 
specific for just abortion. It's there's many other ethical issues in, in medicine, but that ethics committee will then decide and if this is appropriate to offer the patient, the mother, an elective abortion. And so it's it's very well organized where physicians have to get together and decide what is the medical diagnosis of the mother's health, what is her the medical concern if the pregnancy were to continue, will the pregnancy exacerbate or worsen her condition to the point of risking her organs or her life, and if that's the case, then they come to a decision to offer the patient an elective termination of that pregnancy. Hmm. And then the patient has that choice to make um, if they want to proceed with that or not. Mm -hmm. And that's going to continue. Hospitals will continue to be required to have these ethics committees. So mm -hmm. if, a, if that type of termination is offered, it's not just a, you know, elective abortion. That is a medically recommended abortion, and that would continue to be available. Interesting. So that will be an interesting conversation that continues as we see cases come, I'm sure, in Louisiana. And um, I know a lot of people have said, have asked, okay, well, is it, you know, as a pro-life person, if I say I do not want to have an elective abortion, but I do have cancer and I do still want to receive um, radiation, you know, chemotherapy, sometimes they ask, is it, is it moral for me to receive it, even if it has a chance of killing my unborn child? Would I be killing my unborn child by receiving um, chemotherapy that increases a chance of that. Um, I don't know if that's something that you want to answer, but I, I mean, I know like very simply on our end, we say no, like that is, that is a moral, like that is a good and moral choice that you can make to receive chemotherapy while pregnant, even if it increases the chance of potentially killing your unborn child, you are not directly killing your unborn child. It is an, an indirect occurrence that would happen. Um, but there have been many instances where mothers have received chemotherapy or have chosen, you know, one way or another to not have an elective abortion and then wait till after the pregnancy or they, there's so many particular situations here um, that vary from woman to woman where um, someone has been able to make good and moral and pro-life choices all along the way, even if you're weighing, uh, like weighing um, uh, risks and benefits. Correct. Yes. Well, there's so many nuances to this particular scenario, right. uh, specifically in the various um, ways of administering radiation therapy and locations, and then a huge host of different types of chemotherapy, a huge host of uh, side potential side effects mm -hmm. to the patient herself and to the baby, that um, those situations are quite that a woman can uh, make that decision with her physician in, in investigating all of the um, potential effects of that medication. So um, luckily, those situations, as tragic as they are, they're, they're not as common. But when they occur, um, the woman still does have her uh, right, absolutely, to make that decision, um, mm. to, to not terminate the pregnancy, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, um, for anybody who you know has been listening this whole time and wants to continue doing research on um, on these topics or on these situations, is there anywhere that you would recommend pointing them toward? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, for women who may find themselves pregnant, there is unfortunate, you know, unexpected um, situations in our life. There's two centers which are a wealth of resources and wonderful support. One is uh, the Women's Health Center.org, and women's is spelled W O M E N S. So the Women's Health Help center.org that is in baton rouge okay. another one is women's new life.com that's w-o-m-a-n-s women's new life.com and that's in baton rouge and new orleans um mm -hmm. two wonderful resources to go to um that that are helpful and there's lots of resources that they can put uh, women to throughout the state for support um that they can go seek that's wonderful. Well, um, Casey, has there been any sort of 
questions at all have come up in our live or if people just been listening and hearing everything that they needed to. I was listening and appreciating. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Um, so we haven't had any questions today, but I know that there are so many different misconceptions out there. Um, so a vast majority of things that we could have been discussing today, but this is this is um, the kind of barriers which we put our discussion in because there's so much. We just really want to break it down. So I just want to let uh, people know who are listening, watching this, that we will probably have Dr. Griffin on again, um, maybe in another session or a couple of other sessions after this. And if you have any questions following our discussion, please email me, alex at prolifelouisiana.org. And Louisiana Right to Life will be happy to answer you and send you some resources and links for more information. We can also forward your questions on to Dr. Griffin, who has graciously joined us. Um, also, I think we'll go ahead and put in the comment section um, a link to the, pro, the, the law that we have, the trigger law that had been on the books that is now in effect, um, you know, now that Roe v. Wade is overturned. And this is called the Reaffirmation of the Human Life Protection Act. So please, like um, like Dr. Here mentioned, do your research. You know, if you have, you know, some feelings that have come up from uh, these posts, and you really need to dig in and, and know how to either answer people who are who are feeling these fears, um, or you're just like, okay, I really want to be as as medically accurate and pro life as I can possibly be, and I want to understand these situations. Click these links, read the law, read more, ask us questions. Dr. Evelyn, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been um, an amazing discussion, and, and I hope it's the beginning of many more. I agree, and I encourage people um, just to feel inspired by the miracle of life. It's okay to find joy in that, and I've seen that as an obstetrician gynecologist at every uh, stage of pregnancy, unfortunately, in losses as well and uh, throughout birth. So it's it's okay to be happy with it and, and celebrate it. It really is uh, much into the thick of the science as I am. Um, <laughs> it is a miracle to have so many, you know, correct uh, DNA base pairings <laughs> that will then lead to a full complex and caring organism. And I really don't see any moment in time from fertilization onwards that if you interrupt it, we can't turn into you and me. So yeah. I truly really wow. think um, there is a miracle to it all and it's it's to be celebrated. So thank you for having me, Alan. Thank you. Everyone else, please have a wonderful weekend and a good July 4th. And safe July 4th. Bye-bye.